Taz exploded onto the WWF roster when he debuted in the year 2000. It was at the Royal Rumble when Kurt Angle issued an open challenge to anyone in the back to end his undefeated streak. The crowd in Madison Square Garden roared with approval as Taz answered the challenge and made Angle tap in just three minutes. This debut spelled out what Taz was all about. Expectations were really high for Taz in the WWF and his first actions at the Royal Rumble was a great start, but somehow things didn't pan out in the World Wrestling Federation. It would be a quick descent down the pecking order between the year 2000 and 2002 when he transitioned to being a commentator. In this video, we're taking a look at the factors that contributed to Taz's humiliating decline. This is how the WWF put an end to the in-ring career of the human suplex machine. Before we start today's video, if this is the kind of wrestling content that you're into, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and a subscribe if you haven't already. It's much appreciated. Before Taz became a footnote in WWF history, he was a major player in Extreme Championship Wrestling. He made his ECW debut in 1993 where he was known as the Tasmaniac. He got his first taste of gold when he won the television championship in 1994. And within a span of two years, Taz had undergone a transformation into a violent, suplex-throwing shoot fighter. It wasn't long before he was a main event player on the ECW roster. Even a broken neck in 1995 didn't stop him from coming back even harder and climbing to the top of the promotion. Taz's intense promos told the fans that he didn't care about them and he certainly didn't care about his opponents. Naturally, this made the ECW fans love or love to hate him even more. This attitude came to the forefront even more in his feud with ECW champion Shane Douglas. Douglas was unable to compete due to injury and Taz was frustrated by the inability to compete for the championship and so he decided to take matters into his own hands. He introduced the FTW Championship as an unsanctioned title, declaring himself the real world champion. However, his actual coronation came in 1999 when he won the ECW World Heavyweight Championship for the first time, signalling his place at the top of the promotion. Taz truly was the big dog in ECW's yard, and it was totally believable that he could dismantle anyone who stepped into the ring with him. In terms of rivalries that shaped his reputation, his matches with Sabu were iconic. The matches weren't just bouts, they were all-out wars. The feud went on for years and helped ECW gain its fearsome reputation. Taz's feud with Bam Bam Bigelow brought out the best in both men. The two faced off in a series of matches that pushed them both to their limits but it was during their match at Living Dangerously in 1998 that fans would be treated to this memorable moment. One of the things that really set Taz apart was his wrestling style. His finisher was the Taz Mission, a Carter Hajime judo choke that could easily finish an opponent in a real fight. His uncompromising, debilitating style was totally unique. In fact, he came across as legitimately dangerous. While Vince McMahon and the WWF were stuck in a creative rut during the mid-90s, offering up cartoonish gimmicks and bad storytelling aimed at children, Taz and ECW, by extension, were taking a radically different approach. If the WWF was Disney, then ECW was Grindhouse. ECW was filling a void for adult wrestling fans who were disenchanted with the WWF and that idea could be credited to Paul Heyman. While McMahon was pushing characters like Mantar and Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, Heyman was giving a platform to the likes of Taz and Rob Van Dam. Heyman truly was a visionary. He worked magic at accentuating the positives and downplaying the negatives on his wrestling show. And it was clear that ECW didn't have the budget of WCW or the WWF, but they made up for it in other ways. 
There was no flashy presentation on ECW shows, but there was substance. Heyman's skill as a producer also extended to the roster. He was incredibly talented at masking the wrestlers' weaknesses while highlighting their talents. He did it with the Sandman, for example. The Sandman was never a good wrestler, so Heyman made him an everyman come hardcore icon. He got over with the fans because he swilled beer, he smoked cigarettes, and he absorbed an obscene amount of punishment when the bell rang. Take Rob Van Dam as another example. He was a fantastic wrestler with loads of charisma, but at the start of his career, he just wasn't a great promo guy. All of RVD's charisma came out physically during his matches, and so Heyman kept him quiet and paired him with Bill Alfonso, a manager who could handle the bulk of the talking. And when it came to Taz, Heyman capitalised on his unique wrestling style and his tough guy persona. Knowing that Taz wasn't the tallest wrestler on the roster, Heyman cleverly presented him as a dangerous, take-no-prisoners fighter whose size was basically irrelevant. By the end of the 90s, ECW was on shaky ground financially. While Paul Heyman had been a wizard creatively, he struggled to maintain a similar balancing act when it came to the business side of the company. One glaring symptom of the company's decline was the departure of key talent to the WWF and WCW. Many of these defectors had a deep-rooted loyalty to the Church of ECW, but their checks started to bounce. They all reluctantly left what they considered to be their wrestling home, because quite simply, they needed to make a living. Taz saw the writing on the wall too, but he also had other reasons to leave. His passion for wrestling had started to fade when he reached the top of ECW, leaving him feeling unfulfilled and as though he'd achieved everything he could in Philadelphia. Around this time, both WCW and the WWF came calling, and it was ultimately Jim Ross who would successfully sign Taz to a contract in 1999. A new era was about to begin for Taz, but little did he know that he would never reach the same heights ever again in his career. The WWF teased Taz's debut in the weeks before the Royal Rumble. Madison Square Garden was the venue. Taz answered Kurt Angle's open challenge, putting an end to his undefeated streak. And the fans blew the roof off Madison Square Garden. For a brief period, it seemed as though the WWF was fully invested in Taz. On commentary, JR and Lawler put him over as being seriously dangerous, even questioning whether his finisher was legal. In an unusual twist, they even allowed him to briefly go back to ECW, where he faced the champion Mike Awesome. Awesome had controversially signed with WCW while he was still the ECW champion, and so Paul Heyman made a request to Vince McMahon. McMahon agreed and let Taz go back to ECW for one night, where he defeated WCW wrestler Mike Awesome for the ECW World Championship. Taz came out of this situation looking great. He dominated Awesome before beating him and walked away with the title. When he arrived back on SmackDown, the WWF wasted no time in taking the wind out of his sails. They decided to book the ECW champion Taz against the WWF champion Triple H in a non-title match in Philadelphia. Triple H soundly beat Taz in just over five minutes. The question has to be asked, why book this match in the first place? It just took all of Taz's momentum away and achieved nothing positive. In fact, this loss to Triple H was symbolic of Taz's fast, downward spiral in the Federation. To add insult to injury, Taz lost the ECW title to Tommy Dreamer just two days later. Taz's feud with Jerry Lawler was actually pretty good. It made him look like a mean, nasty bully. That's for sure. It all started with him picking on JR at ringside. Lawler stood up for his buddy and knocked Taz out. Things escalated over the next few weeks and then it was time for SummerSlam where a match was booked between the men to sort things out once and for all. 
While the build up to the match was really good, the result did absolutely nothing for Taz. JR got involved at the end of the match, allowing Lawler to get the win. The match only lasted for 4 minutes and 21 seconds, and once again, Taz was left looking like a chump. If anything, it spelled out that Taz was never going to be a main eventer in the WWF, and he probably wouldn't even be an upper mid-carder. And that's no surprise, because the roster was absolutely stacked in the year 2000. The Rock, Triple H and The Undertaker were all on top, and just underneath were the likes of Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. But even if the roster wasn't loaded with top talent, Vince McMahon would always have been Taz's biggest problem when it came to being pushed. Considering that McMahon had a problem pushing anyone under 6 foot tall, 5 foot 8 inch Taz really never stood a chance. On his podcast, JR revealed that some of the roster even thought that he was dangerous to work with. People thought his suplexes were dangerous, all this other stuff. A lot of the talents get back to Vince and say, you know, I don't really want to work with this guy, he's dangerous. He heard it enough and he saw that a lot of top talents were uncomfortable in stepping in the ring with Taz. He finally took it to heart. Things would reach absolute rock bottom for Taz when the WCW ECW invasion started in 2001. As the storyline unfolded, Taz became the mouthpiece of the Alliance defending them verbally whenever possible, and yet for some reason he was made to be the whipping boy. Week after week he was humiliated and bullied by other Alliance members, with the worst coming from Stone Cold. Reportedly he was supposed to have a competitive match with Austin at some point, but Austin ended up refusing because he didn't want to bump for a midget, and so Austin squashed Taz in the space of a minute instead. This was Taz's final burial as an in-ring performer. All of the mystique that he'd built up in ECW, along with the momentum he got from his debut against Angle just a few months before, had gone up in smoke. But we have to ask the question, was there a reason for this to happen beyond McMahon having a problem with his height? Apparently, some thought he had a bad attitude when he first arrived in the Federation, Allegedly, he wanted to keep his ECW character intact. He didn't want to compromise when it came to his wrestling style, and McMahon simply wouldn't let him use some of his more dangerous moves. Either way, the injuries started mounting up. After less than a year on the active roster, Taz decided to call it quits. But interestingly, he wasn't fired. McMahon was obviously keen to utilise him in different ways. He started doing part-time commentary on Sunday Night Heat, and at the start of 2001, he became a full-time commentator on SmackDown and Pay-Per-View after Jerry Lawler left the company. And then he was hired as one of the trainers for Tough Enough before making a brief in-ring comeback where he won the tag team titles alongside Spike Dudley. Taz's WWF career was a missed opportunity, but knowing Vince McMahon's disdain for smaller wrestlers, it's hardly a surprise that he didn't achieve much in those few months on the active roster. Despite coming in hot with an explosive debut, he quickly found himself being diminished. But we shouldn't forget all of the incredible moments he forged in ECW. Over many years, his character was consistent in Paul Heyman's House of Hardcore, even if his in-ring career in the WWF was a chapter best forgotten, Taz's overall legacy in the world of wrestling remains massively significant.